Hotel is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. Godtel is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtel is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtel is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God tell. You'll hear me, but not very well. <clears throat> You're going to hear a lot of funny noises. That's all right. Sunday night when we sang, there were a lot of funny noises. First Timothy chapter three. <clears throat> Qualifications for church leaders. Sometimes I wonder why we go through this, <clears throat> any of it, because most people aren't going to do what God says anyway. But at least it's not my fault if you get in trouble. And some of you are going to be in trouble. Qualifications for church leaders. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, <clears throat> not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Let those also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their houses well. For they that have <clears throat> used the office of a deacon well purchased of themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto you, hoping to come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar, the ground of truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse 1 now. <clears throat> this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, it's also just a church leader in the church. Uh, people use different titles in different churches. But in Psalms 37, 4, it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. To delight yourself in the Lord means to be totally satisfied with Jesus. When you're totally satisfied with Jesus, then he can put the right desires in your heart to pursue the things that you ought to pursue. So what he's saying is, here's a man who has delighted himself in the Lord, and now God has put it into his heart to seek the office 
of a bishop. And then he gives these qualifications for a bishop. <clears throat> a bishop, whose heart then would be in the right place, must be blameless. Church leaders ought to be blameless. There should be nothing about them that would cause anybody to blame or accuse them of anything. <clears throat> I've known preachers who preached their sermons and did a good job and then left the church parking lot with another person's wife in their car. And I thought, well, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to him preach anymore, you know. And they do all kinds of crazy stuff sometimes. Fortunately, it's not all of them, just some. But those are the ones that give everybody else a bad name. <clears throat> Bishop must be blameless. Shun the very appearance of evil, the Bible says. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. And he must be the husband of a wife. Now, the literal translation of this, he must be the husband of at least one wife. He's got to have a wife. And when we get to verse 5, it'll explain why. But he's got to have a wife. This leaves out single men. Single men should not be bishops or any kind of church leader, really. And you'll see why when we get to verse 5. The bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, means that watching all the time, taking care, being careful, sober, that's not just from alcohol, but sober-minded, we've talked about that before, of good behavior, given to hospitality, that means extending a hand out to others, and apt or able and willing to teach. A bishop, as well as a deacon, as we're going to discover, should be teachers. And you know what's amazing? I've been in churches where deacons, for instance, wouldn't teach. Where deacons in the church wouldn't even stand up and I've had pastors say, why don't you call on, we had a church I was in, we had 60 deacons one time, and I asked the pastor, I said, could you have one deacon every night, every Sunday night, lead us in prayer and tell us a little bit about himself so we get to know the deacons. He said, I can't do that. I said, why not? He said, because they won't do it. And they're deacons. But a lot of people become deacons because they got money. And the people don't want them to leave the church, so, you know, give them a position. <clears throat> not given to wine, no striker. That means argumentative. Now, there are some things in the Bible that are worth arguing about. That's all Paul and the apostles, the early guys. They argued all the time. But they argued about important things like who Jesus is. Is he God who created everything? Or is he something less? Is he just a man? Well, the argument is that he's God and we're not going to give that up. But to argue about what color carpet goes in the church is kind of stupid. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you have any carpet. We don't have any carpet. So we don't have anything to argue about, do we? Not greedy of filthy lucre. There's nothing wrong with money. Money in and of itself is not filthy. It's the way you get it. Filthy lucre means ill-gotten gain. It's money that you've gotten through shady means, you know, like skimming the offering plate when it comes. <laughs> there are people that do that, you know. There are some preachers that own everything in the church and all the money, everything belongs to them. Patient. I'm patient. But I wish God would hurry up. But I'm patient. Not brawlers. You know, there's some people who are great preachers that some people would think they were brawlers. Uh, comes to mind Billy Sunday. He was the predecessor, predecessor to Billy Graham. Great preacher. Preached great tent revivals, big tent revivals. And there's some things when I was reading his biography that happened that were really funny. But at the same time, some people probably took wrong. One day in middle August, it was hot. And a man walked in the back of this huge tent where he had thousands of people. And uh, he walked in with a big overcoat on. And when he got up to the front, he opened up the overcoat and pulled out a bullwhip. 
And he said, Billy Sunday, the devil has commissioned me to whip you. And Billy Sun Sunday, who was a professional baseball player before he became a preacher, very athletic man, he jumped off the stage onto the man and while he was jumping, he said, and God has commissioned me to whip you. <laughs> and they had a fight right there in front of the church. <laughs> Billy Sunday was a character. He, they would do the music and then they would announce that he's coming on stage and he would run on stage and slide like he's sliding into second base. And uh, he used the things God gave him, you know, but one, one instance that was hilarious to me a man walked in. That people used to disrupt their meetings in the old days. They'd do this all the time. And he'd come in there and he says, Billy Sunday, there's not one word in this Bible that's true. You can't show me one thing in this Bible that's actually true. And Billy Sunday reached down with two fingers, put them in the man's nostrils, and pulled and pulled and pulled until his nose started bleeding. And then he turned to Proverbs and it says, Surely as the churning of the milk brings forth butter, the wringing of the nose brings forth blood. He said, how about that one? <laughs> so some people would probably look at that kind of stuff and say, well, that man's a brawler. But there's another side to the coin. If you look at those instances, they were all provoked and answered in a way that made perfectly good sense. I mean, you and I may not be that bold, but he was a different guy in a different time. <clears throat> not covetous, that's lustful. You can, folks, when you, when you mention the word lust, it doesn't have to do with sex always. That's just what we perceive. You can lust after a chair. I don't know why you would, but somebody could be sitting in your favorite chair and you want that chair. You would kill for that chair. That's my chair. You know, we have people in our church like that. They have their seat and you better not sit in their seat. I remember one time I went to a large church to visit one time and I sat down. I got there early and the pews were pretty much empty. And I sat down and a woman came over to me who was probably, she looked like she was 200 years old, but she's probably closer to 90 or 80 or something. I don't know. But anyway, she had a big old huge purse. I'll never forget this purse. And she said, Sonny, you're sitting in my seat. Well, I got it moved. I was afraid she hit me with that purse. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous, but there's some people that's where they're going. That, they want that. That's what they want. Whether it makes sense or not is irrelevant. You can lust after a candy bar. People that steal them. <laughs> she knows. The voice of experience. But, you know, pe some people go in and they steal a candy bar, you know, a 50 cent candy bar. But you got to understand it before you could steal that candy bar, you had to covet it. That means you lusted after that candy bar. Someday I'll tell you about the story about a man I told he had, he had a, a sexual relationship with a candy bar. It was his lover. <laughs> that is true. <clears throat> One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That means he t teaches them the word of God. He's a constant uh, ruler in this house to the degree that his children are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They, this gravity thing, they have their feet on the ground. They're going to be better off than the children that didn't learn these things when they were growing up. Now here's the reason that a man has to have at least a wife here. <clears throat> if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I mean, we were Catholic growing up. And one of the things that I never was too excited about is the priests. Now, there's nothing in the Bible about priests not getting married. In fact, the Bible says just the opposite. But some man came up with this idea and they all swallowed it. And look at the trouble they're in with pedophiles and every other kind of thing you can imagine. But if I needed marriage counseling, would I go to a Catholic priest? What in the world would he know about it? Not a thing. That's why he says the bishop must have a wife so they can look into his house, his wife, his kids, and they can see how those children are being raised, how his wife acts, 
Is he ruling the house as a spiritual leader of the house? Is he a bully, a dictator? What is he? And then when you see what he does at home, then you can make a better uh, choice as to whether he qualifies to be a leader in the church. We don't do that anymore. We've got preachers whose wives are out of control. Children that are out of control. You know? I mean, it's, just, it's crazy. And we don't follow what God says. And that's where the problem is. <clears throat> Another thing he says is not a novice. That means a new convert. That's another thing we do in our churches that I've worked in quite a few churches, preached in about 600 revival meetings and concerts in churches all across the country. And I've watched this happen. A guy comes in, good looking young man, usually, usually a guy, 22, 24, something like that. He gets all excited. He makes a profession of faith. And the next thing you know, they want him to be the youth director. A lot of these kids that are youth directors shouldn't be youth directors. Now, when I talk about this, I'm talking about maturity. I'm not talking about age as a number. There are some guys at 21 are very mature. There's some guys at 40 that are still 12. And, you know, we, we don't seem to care. I, I was in one church where we hired this guy who was a, a football player at SFA and a Christian. He'd been a Christian for several years. And we hired him to be our youth director. And he was a godly man, a good guy. And I, I felt really sorry for him because he came to our men's meeting one time to ask for prayer. And, um, you know, they say confession is good for the soul, but it's really bad for the reputation. And he came in there and he said, brethren, now he's a youth director over the college kids and the high school kids. And um, he says, brethren, I need you to pray for me that I can get victory over lust. I don't want to lust, you know. He did the right thing. But instead of them praying for him, they fired him. And they hired somebody else who may be worse, but he's not honest about it. They don't want to hear it. They got their little old girls over there in this class and they don't want to hear the truth. And I would have rather had that guy stay there. He was open and said, look, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not really having a big problem with this, but it could be a problem and I want you to pray for me. He did the right thing. Later on, of course, he left there and he became a pastor and he, he's been a pastor for years and years and years. Loves the Lord. A great guy. But our church deacons and elders would rather have somebody that will lie to them because they're not really right with God. They just happen to be in charge. So not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, most men... And I say men because I'm talking about pastors here or bishops. Most men, you know, they're not really mature enough to pastor a church till they're well into their 30s, 40s. Really. Some are. Charles Spurgeon, he started pastoring the London Tabernacle when he was 16 years old. But he was 16 going on 45. He was very mature. And he stayed in that one church until he died at age 57. And preached to crowds of over 6,000 before they even had sound systems or anything. But he is a unique person and rather Manly Beasley. He started preaching when he was very young. But he was like that. He was very mature. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. I was immature well into my 30s. My wife still thinks I still am. I should have got a bigger laugh. We're going to have to work on a sense of humor again. I was what they call a late bloomer. That's why all through high school I didn't learn very much because I always was cutting up, pulling pranks, you know. I was doing stuff that eighth graders would have been doing when I was a senior. I thought it was funny. But other people, they're very mature at, at a younger age. <clears throat> so we're talking here about the maturity of the person. 
a novice who falls into this prideful area will be condemned by the devil. Condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. That means the lost people on the outside. I remember something that happened to me that was very uh, eye-opening. When we first started God Tell back in 1975 and then 77, bought our first building that next year, uh, the town merchants in Nacogdoches just didn't want us there. Now, I've outlived every one of them, so I got even. In fact, when we sold that building downtown a few months ago, there was not a merchant there that was there when we started. And uh, they were always trying to get rid of us and how bad it was, having a homeless shelter downtown, you know, and all this junk. But then one day they had a meeting, uh, Downtown Merchants Association had a meeting. I wasn't invited, so I didn't go. But I heard later that one of the things that came up is what are we going to do about God tell? We've got to get rid of God. They need to move. They need to go somewhere. And a guy <clears throat> in the meeting stood up and he said, friends, he said, I know we don't like Brother June. He said, but at least there's one thing you can say about him. We know where he stands. When I heard that, I thought, you know, that's the best compliment I've ever gotten in my life. And all these years later, it's still the best compliment I ever got in my life. For somebody to know exactly what you stand for. And if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. So you need to stand for something. <clears throat> Good report. The lost people should even say, hey, we don't like the dude, but at least we know what he stands for. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So you have to be able to even get a recommendation from lost people. Likewise, must the deacons be grave? <clears throat> Some of them are in the grave. They're walking around, but they're in the grave. Grave means back to sober-minded. Not double-tongued. So we can't say white man speak with forked tongue. They're not supposed to be double-tongued, not supposed to be speaking out of both sides of their mouth, saying one thing to one person, another thing to another person. It's supposed to be honest. Not given to much wine. That's an interesting phrase. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't have a glass of wine once in a while or a beer. What the Bible says is don't be a drunk. But for most of you, you're like me. The best way not to be a drunk is what? Just don't drink. And I figured that out 43 years ago. Was it 43 years? It was longer than that. 46. Don't drink. It's just simpler. Not greedy. A filthy lucre. And folks, we've got preachers, some of them on television, that their whole thing is about money. If you can't figure that out, I feel sorry for you. When them guys start flashing their Rolex watches and talking about their house, well, Robert Tilton, before he fell, he was living in a $5 million house. What preacher needs a $5 million house? Used to be we lived in parsonages. But preachers wanted their own houses because they wanted to be able to invest and because the churches didn't treat them rightly either. And you get a parsonage and then the next day you find out you're fired. And then you got to move out. So I can understand. But there is such a thing as excess. I've heard of preachers, and I've known some of them. One guy was driving around Dallas in a Ferrari. Other ones have Rolls Royce limousines with chauffeurs. And they preach on TV, and sometimes they preach things like, well, I'm rich because Jesus was rich. Well, that's a crock, or a crock of dial, or a crock of gator, or something. It's not true. Jesus had no place to lay his head. I don't know where they got him to be rich out of that. I guess they read a different Bible, their own customized version. But some of them say that. And they preach stuff like, you know, if you get right with God, God will make windows of heaven open up and make you rich. Folks, it's a lie. It's all a lie. In the Bible, prosperity is not de defined by money. It's defined by being able to take the truth of this book and converting it into reality in your life. 
So when you sing victory in Jesus, you're not lying. Most people sing victory in Jesus. Tell them, they don't have any victory. They can't even quit smoking. Ooh, I said that, didn't I? Oh, bad boy. <laughs> now some of you can't wait to get to the smoking deck. So I'll have to preach two minutes longer to aggravate you. <clears throat> Not greedy, a filthy lucre. Holding the mystery of faith and a pure conscience. The mystery of faith is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And let these also be first proved. That means tested. In other words, you don't just grab a guy because he looks good. I, you know, I used to get so tired of this stuff. Fellow joins the church. He works at the bank. Next thing you know, he's appointed to be on the finance committee. Don't know anything about him, but he works at the bank. Must be honest, he works at the bank. Must know finances. But you see, God's finances and the bank's finances are two different things. The way you operate a church is supposed to be anyway, by faith. I'll never forget old brother Bob Clements. He's, he's passed on to hit glory now, but he built missions all over the valley and in Mexico. He pastored First Baptist Church for a long time down there. And he was preaching a revival meeting in this church and they had this scoreboard up there you know, where it tells how many church members came Sunday and Sunday school and what the offering was. And down at the bottom it had a building fund offering. And he said, what's that? And they said, well, that's our building fund. When it gets to so-and-so amount, we're going to build a building. He says, give me a quarter and faith and I'll build you a building. But see, most of our churches are operating on the same principles as the bank not finding out what God wants. God may not even want them to build a building. Nobody asks. They just say, God, will you bless this? But they didn't even ask God if he wanted it in the first place. He may not. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. That means a clean heart. Test the deacons before they're put into office and then let them use the office of the deacon, being found blameless. No accusations. No hint of something going wrong, something not right in their life. Even so must their wives be in the grave. Oh no, be gra <laughs> grave, not slanderers. Not busybodies, not running around tattling, tailing and talking behind people's backs. Gossipers. Sober. Faithful in how many things? All things. All things. That means she's going to treat her husband like the Bible says she should treat her husband. Doesn't matter really what he's like. She's going to do what she's supposed to be doing. Now, if this is a Christian family, of course, he's going to be doing what he's supposed to be doing. And he will love his wife like he's supposed to, like Christ loved the church. She's going to be raising the children properly. I've seen some women who don't care about the children. All they care about is eating more and more. And they sit there. We used to say it this way, funny, and when we were kids, they're sitting on the couch eating bonbons. I don't even know if they even make bonbons anymore, but, you know, and then you get this picture in your mind of this woman, and I've seen them in homes where they don't care about anything. They don't keep the house. They don't take care of the house. They don't take care of their husband. He has to do everything if it's going to get done. I was visiting in a home one time where they asked me to, uh, if they could have some money for food. They needed food and diapers for the baby. So I go over to the house to make a home visit. And here's this really, really large woman sitting on the couch with a trail of cockroaches. I'm telling you the truth. Cockroaches going over, look like ants, you know, ants walking the trail. Cockroaches, every ashtray in the house was full of cigarette butts. And they were asking me for money for food for the kids and diapers. And I walked into the kitchen and opened up the refrigerator and there was a six pack of beer. And I came back out and I said, lady, 
What do you do all day? She don't do nothing. I said, well, we can't help you. You need to get up off this couch and go help yourself. And uh, another lady walked in one day. I got tickled at her. She had a pack of cigarettes in her pocket and a T-shirt, you know, with a pocket. She walked in and she says, Preacher, I, I, I need to see if you guys can give me $40 so I can pay my light bill. She says, I'm, I'm $40 short this month paying my light bill. And I looked over at Nancy and I said, she doesn't want $40 to pay her light bill. She wants $40 to put back into, to pay the light bill from the $40 she took out of the light bill to buy cigarettes this month. I wouldn't, wouldn't help her. So I'm sorry. You smoked up your light bill. Live without lights. People say, oh, Brother June, you're just mean. Well, you can call it what you want. But when you really analyze it, you'll figure out it's the truth. <clears throat> Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So they too must be married. Ruling their children with their own, and their own houses well. So you've got this example. The guy says he wants to be a deacon. And people came to him and said, we would like you to be a deacon. Okay, we're going to test you. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to make some surprise home visits. Yeah, so what's supposed to happen? Come in and see what's going on down there. Are the kids bouncing off the wall? You know, like little heathens or are they well-mannered children? I'm not talking about children that don't play. Children play. They're supposed to play. And some of them are rather hyper. We had six and all of ours were hyper. But we didn't put them on medication. We ruled, the, I ruled the house and our kids knew when they could jump it off and walk on the ceiling and when they couldn't. That's like those karate movies, you know. They, no, they didn't do that. <laughs> Aren't those funny, those karate movies? The guy comes in and, and then he just walks up a wall and across the ceiling. And you guys believe that kind of stuff can happen? You ought to try it. Of course, don't yell when you bang your head on the floor. <clears throat> Ruling their houses and their children well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree. That means a reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. You can enter heaven with a full reward or no reward or a partial reward. The office of the deacon brings a reward. Now these rewards that we get for our Christian life and service are not for us. It's not so we can have a trophy case in heaven. And so we can present this to our Lord. You paid the penalty for my sin. I did these things for you. That's what the rewards are for. These things write I unto you, hoping to come to see you shortly. And Paul was a short man. Here we go. No laughter. Yeah, Martin, Martin smiled. But if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is supposed to be a place where the truth is preached. The truth can set you free. Lies will put you in bondage. Truth can set you free. Last verse. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. Six things. <clears throat> First of all, God was manifest in the flesh. When was that? Well, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word that was God became flesh. That's when he was manifested in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit testified of Christ that he was God. At the baptism of Jesus, when he came up, remember the windows of heaven opened up and the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. Scene of angels. Now, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Jesus said that when he was in heaven, he saw Lucifer cast out like lightning onto the earth. Lucifer was the most beautiful, most intelligent, the greatest angel, archangel that ever was created by God. He was next to God. But it got lifted up in pride, Isaiah chapter 14. 
He got lifted up in pride and tried to take over and he wanted to become God. God whooped his little self and put him out. Threw him out. Jesus was there because he's God. Preached unto the Gentiles. That was Paul's job. Believed on in the world. That's still going on today. And received up into glory. Of course, that was on Acts chapter 1. Jesus was ascending. And he told the boys, he said, Guys, as you see me go, in like manner I shall return. So when he comes back, he's going to come exactly the same as when he left. <clears throat> if you don't understand why this is important, let me give you a brief summary so you will. In our world today, just about everything that God says, we do the opposite. I heard a story of a man, this is true, and he was an elderly man in a church. He was one of the deacons. And somebody brought to the church body that they wanted to ordain a woman in this Baptist church as a deacon. <clears throat> so the old man, being very wise, didn't say anything at that time. And he let the process go on and on until she was finally before the deacon board to be examined. <clears throat> and everybody was taking turns asking questions. Finally, it got to the old man. And he said, Madam, how many wives do you have? She said, well, I don't have a wife. I have a husband. He said, but the Bible says, and he quoted this verse, that the deacon must be the husband of one wife. Therefore, brethren, I move that we dismiss these proceedings. And they did. Because they saw it. The problem is, see, everything that God says, we want to do the opposite. The Bible tells us what a bishop, what a deacon should be like. And we got people that are in leadership positions that have no business being there. They're corrupt. They're evil. They're wicked. Thank God for the godly ones that are out there. But the other ones are causing Christianity to have, as we would say, a black eye. Way too many of them. Way too many of them. That's true. <clears throat> and it's like that with everything. God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what do we do? We shack up and say, but we're in love. It has nothing to do with anything. We're in love. You know, we don't want to give like God says we're supposed to give of ourselves and our resources. We don't want to do that either. We want a handout. We want a free ride. And there's some of you sitting here that you'll just be glad to get a free meal every day and never have to do anything if you can get away with it. And if I was here long enough, it wouldn't take me too long to identify you. So I've got the ones in Nacogdoches and Livingston pegged. And there's some there they don't want to do anything. I force them into it. Because I say, you know, if you don't get with the program here and do a little bit of this or that, and I give them something to do, there's the door. Of course, Martin's nicer than me. He feels sorry for you. I don't. I feel sorry for me. <laughs> Joking. God says that marriage is between a man and a woman. We want to get two women married, two men married. God says we need to preserve life because it's precious and we kill babies, you know, and each other if we're not careful. Just about everything. God says the first should be last, but we still want to be first. God says turn the other cheek, but we're not going to turn the other cheek. I mean, the least little insult, we're looking for a baseball bat. Are you looking at me? Huh? Are you looking at me? You better not be looking at me. We were in the office today, and Mike, who works for us, was in there, and our secretary, one of our other ladies, was in there. She looked over at me. I said, you looking at me? Look at him. <laughs> she went, oh, she's about freaked out. <laughs> but we're always doing the opposite of what God says. And the thing is, God is going to hold us accountable. All of us. For whatever part that we're supposed to be doing, if we're not doing it, God's going to hold us accountable. 
And some of you think, oh, I'm not doing anything. That's part of, part of the problem, not doing anything. Father, we thank you for loving us, and we do thank you for each one in this room tonight. We're very grateful that we could be here and get through this service. We ask you to bless your word, as you promised you'd do. We thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen.